So today you have the pleasure to have a talk uh, by Claudio Nor Coelho. So I'm not going to to tell you uh, his long CV with a long list of achievements, but uh, just to briefly to say that uh, Claudio Nor has done his undergrad students at the Ferdinand University of uh, Minas Gerais at Belo Horizonte, Brazil. Then he has done his PhD in uh, Stanford. His advisor was Professor Giovanni De Micheli. And then uh, Claudio Nor has a long list of uh, achievements in the industry, working with uh, uh, Verplex, uh, then Jasper. So he was the main responsible for the setup of uh, Jasper Labs in Belo Horizonte where uh, he was also a professor at the Federal University of Minas Gerais. And then also Claudio Noro worked in several other companies, and uh, you can see this by his brief uh, CV available in the uh, publicity of this talk. And now, uh, as you can see, Claudio Noro is uh, with Google. So thank you very much, Claudio Noro, to accept our invitation. And then uh, I give the floor for you to start your talk. Thank you again. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ricardo. And thanks, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. And today I'm going to be talking about designing uh, application specific machine learning course. Uh, this is some research that I have been doing uh, in Google. And I have to put a disclaimer that this does not reflect my employer's uh, uh, views and, and anything okay uh it, it uh so the outline of the talk is going to be as follows first i'm going to talk about what type of machine learning i'm going to be discussing in this talk uh give you a little bit of historical context uh discuss about uh, uh general purpose ml and application specific ml uh we have uh, developed a library called qcaras which is in github and i'm going to talk about it, uh, in fact, uh, for a large portion of this talk, show you how you can do power estimation using higher level models in these areas, and then give you some conclusions. So if you probably have taken a class on machine learning or a talk on machine learning, you can see that uh, machine learning is a portion of uh, artificial intelligence that attempts to represent intelligence, uh, human intelligence with machines. And one branch of it is machine learning. And specifically, I'm interested in artificial neural networks that can be implemented as digital or analog models, and also on deep neural networks, OK, well, uh, where you use the internal layers to extract features from raw data. This talk is basically the uh, uh, how to implement those digital and analog models, the infrastructure that you need to do that, and also on, on deep neural networks. So there are several uh, frameworks uh, that are in use today to implement a digital, uh, uh, to implement a, a deep neural networks. But if you look at the operations or the high level uh, uh, layers, that they use it's probably contained all of the layers are contained in this list here okay so we have uh, layers that are responsible for vision operations such as convolution polling we have normalization layers uh, recurrent uh, layers activations layers there's a very large number of activation layers which are nonlinear operation you usually put out uh, after uh, matrix multiplication operations and then you have data processing layers uh, or core layers, such as like embeddings, reshaping, split, concat, and, and even dense layers. So this is an example of a deep neural network. And in this example, you can see here that we have like an input of an image. This is like a simple neural network that solves a NIST problem. And it has an input of 28 by 28 by one pixels. And then you have three convolution operations. Uh, the first one with 32 filters, the next ones with 64 and 64 filters. And you can see here that the filter sizes are two by two, three by three, and two by two. 
uh, with the strides of two by two and activation or nonlinear operation, in this case, ReLU. Uh, at the end, we have a flattening operation, and then a dense that generates the classifier for us. So every time I talk to someone who is trying to do artificial neural network acceleration, uh, there are two types of uh, acceleration. First of all, you have to figure out what is the data type that you're going to use. But in most of the cases, training is usually performed in 32 or 64 bits using floating point. Okay. There has been some attempts to do training using a, a lower bit width, but most common uh, uh, and more generic solution is still doing training in, in 32 or 64 bit floating points. Uh, for inference, usually we want to perform low bit width uh, for inference, especially integer uh, or Boolean bit width. Uh, and this is especially important if you're going to do that in edge devices and especially in battery operated edge devices as you have like limited amount of processing or, or limited lifetime of the battery. Our target here is to do training to, that's going to be used in heterogeneous uh, systems. And what I call heterogeneous is that some of the layers may be using eight bits, some of the layers may be using one or two bits. Uh, and that's basically what I call heterogeneous. So the network is, does not use the same type of bit sizes for all the layers. And to do that, we need to think about the, uh, the training and the, the, what type of inference we are going to be doing from the beginning. Okay. For example, typically to do uh, training on those networks, you, you need to do clipping of the values from minus uh, one to plus one. So usually when people come to me and they say, oh, I want to start doing the training of my original model. And I said, okay, add some, for, some form of clipping on it because that's how your model is going to be running at the end. And I'm basically looking at how you can efficiently implement inference engines for edge devices. And specifically, if you're going to be targeting generation, the generation of hardware for those. So let's take, for example, this very uh, simple problem here, that this is like an MNIST uh, model, then I want to basically have some hidden layers here, and then I have the output layer. And if you just take, for example, that we are going to be operating this on this uh, uh, dense implementation, this is by no means an efficient implementation of the dense operation. But the dense operation is basically a matrix multiplication uh, of X and W. Uh, with an addition of bias, okay? So there are several things that are very interesting in this case. Uh, the first one, we have to think about how we are going to have a memory subsystem supporting those operations. As I need to read access, I need to read the weights and bias from the memory or for some device. I need to perform the operation itself and I need to store the output. So you can see here that we have several memory reads an operation and you have a memory out. And I'm not even talking about a specific architecture. I'm just talking about the generic uh, acceleration here. So we need to discuss about memory model. We need to discuss how many Macs are going to support this matrix multiplication because if I have only one Mac, I have to execute this uh, uh, operation sequentially. But if I have, for example, 10 multiply and accumulator operations uh, uh, in parallel, then I can basically unroll this operation here several times. And finally, uh, I do not want to, to do the multiplication, the storage using uh, uh, floating point numbers. As I mentioned before, I want to talk about quantization. So if you, if you look at the, 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 how the, the accelerator usually works, okay, depending on the amount of uh, data traffic you have in your system. Your system may be bounded by the data traffic, which is represented by this purple line here, which represents the memory subsystem. At some point, if you have enough bandwidth, then the system is going to be limited by the architecture, the number of multiply and adds, okay? So you could say, I can operate at the edge or at the limit of this curve, but in reality, you're going to see that uh, the architecture that you have severely uh, uh, 
limits or for example if my architecture is outlined in a certain way i will never be able to fully utilize the number of Macs that i have or the memory subsystem that i have so usually my application will run underneath this curve here somewhere okay and what i'm trying to do here is actually to push the limit on how much you can execute this operation so such that it's going to operate always at the the boundary at the limit so this is very interesting because i started working on the problem of quantization uh, on my previous job which was like um, uh, we we're building a machine with 500 fpjs to do very very fast inference and when i was at nvxl and at the time, people were still doing like FP16, FP34. There were some papers talking about binary or ternary at the time. And then uh, NVIDIA released the FP16 arithmetic. And Microsoft has released FP8 and FP9. And if it, but people were still talking about a homogeneous quantization. So all the layers were quantizing exactly the same way. More recently, some people are realizing that each layer has different requirements for quantization. So the state of the art today is actually to attempt to do heterogeneous quantization with ultra low bit width. And I always like to show you this picture. Uh, I remember when I was at NVXL, uh, the release uh, of the Volta chip, there was like everyone was talking about it because fp16 reduced the hardware uh, uh, demand for arithmetic and at the time we were using altera devices altera supported like it, either integer arithmetic or fp32 and then you're basically discussing with altera how to support uh, fp16 they had no support yet but then like two or three months afterwards there was like xnornet paper that was doing like a plus one minus one arithmetic and, and Microsoft uh, during hot chips presentation they presented FP8 and because and this those two presentations they overshadowed a little bit the everything that happened with the FP16 uh, in the Volta chip and this is quite interesting because if you look in 2019 what Nvidia did with the Turing uh, architecture they actually now have support for multi multiple bit widths so they support like uh it's a still disc discrete but they support boolean int 4 int uh, 8 and fp16 for the multiply and add for the, the memory transfers of course when you're doing the accumulation you need more bits for the accumulation but at least for the multiply and add they now support like a, a diverse uh data types for the tensor force And if you look at heterogeneous quantization with ultra low bit quantization, uh, there has been some work more recently on this. Uh, we have the work from Berkeley. Uh, we have uh, Hawk from MIT. I know at least of uh, uh, another one from Luca Benini discussing about that from ETH. And we presented like a tutorial last year, both at, uh, at DAC and, and ASP DAC and VLSI SOC on, on this topic too. Uh, people have been achieving uh, low bit width precision. And if you look at Im image classification results on ICLR 2019, you can see here that people use four, have been able to reduce the number of bits to four bits, four bits activation. But again, this is using uh, a fixed bit width, uh, not fixed bit width, uh, using uh, the same type of quantization throughout the entire network. And some people have been able to achieve like three bits for uh, weights and activations. So what I'm talking here is uh, how to do a fixed uh, 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 machine learning course for applications. And the first thing that people come to me and they ask, does this make sense to do a fixed uh, uh, application for machine learning? And there are several advantages of doing that. First of all, you can specialize the memory subsystem. So remember when I showed you the, uh, the roof line model, 
uh, if you specialize the memory subsystem, the memory subsystem is going to, to operate very well for that particular application. We can eliminate unnecessary routing resources. If you look at the architecture of programmable uh, neural nets, uh, you can see that a, a very large number of resources are devoted to routing and storage of intermediate results because we, we don't know what type of network that we're going to be finding to, to accelerate. Uh, we can use different quantizations for each processing element, and you can tailor the number of P's to match the performance requirements. So the ultimate goal is to lower area and lower performance and, and to achieve higher performance. For example, uh, recently we have been working with CERN and they have been, they have been able to achieve uh, uh, sub-microsecond inference engines for their problems. So if you list the pros and cons uh, uh, between general purpose and application specific, uh, of course, general purpose, people come to me and say, you can run as many applications as you want. You can run one day a uh, uh, vision problem. The next day you can run uh, a language model. And in ASML, the idea here is that you tailor your uh, uh, architecture to just like one specific structure to one specific architecture. Uh, the model architecture here supports a wide variety of uh, expensive operators. For example, FP16 or INT, 8, INT32. And in ASML, I can basically tailor my entire architecture to be aggressively uh, uh, quantized operations. Uh, the performance, uh, we need to be able to execute this for like a, a millisecond usually. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have been able to run in sub-microsecond inference engines uh, using uh, tailored architectures. Uh, again, the latency here that we're talking is milliseconds, and here we're talking about microseconds or sub-microsecond inference engines. Uh, that's a, programmability is a very interesting thing because in general purpose, people say it's fully supported, fully programmable. But when you start talking to people about what do you mean by you want to reprogram your weights all the time, and then you realize that sometimes they use transfer learning on some, some uh, uh, weights for some layers. And what transfer learning actually does, it actually freezes the weights on some layers. So with an application-specific machine learning uh, in mind, you can actually have programmable weights at the end of the architecture, fixed weights, or fuse, I call this fused weights, because if you fuse the weights into the implementation, you can let, let the logic synthesis also uh, uh, create a better implementation for you. And the silicon area here, of course, it's going to be much smaller if you reduce the amount of reprogrammable resources that you have, and power consumption is going to be like much, much smaller. Uh, one thing that is the drawback of this architecture is that now you have to do pre-training uh, quantization. What is pre-training? Uh, well, you have to start thinking about uh, training from the beginning. And of course, you start with your original model. For, uh, usually I tell people train with the model without any quantization because if that model does not train well, you want to know upfront because quantization can only make the results worse. It can never improve the results. And this has been pointed out by other authors too. And then you apply quantization. We have several types of quantization, stochastic, non-stochastic, binary, ternary, fixed point, exponent quantization. And we do also model optimization. When you do quantization, there is an opportunity here that you can do model optimization together with uh, uh, quantization. And I want just to open a parenthesis here. Why is reducing the model size important? So if you look at this chart on the left, just this chart was presented about the, the, the carbon footprint uh, in terms of CO2. And this last uh, uh, red box here is the, uh, it's like, a, uh, if you're going to do neural architecture search on a transformer network, this is the amount of carbon footprint that uh, you spent. And this is the carbon footprint for a trip between San Francisco and New York. And this, 
Transformers are not the largest network that you have right now. And OpenAI just released a new model that is like uh, several billion parameters. So it's much larger. But uh, uh, just to show you like uh, what does this mean to perform like NAS, I know that everyone has seen the, the fires in the Amazon forest in last August. So if you have like a class, 25 classes around the world, uh, 40 students each, each one performing training on an NAS model, those students would probably burn the same amount of carbon footprint for one day of a, a fire in the Amazon, the entire Amazon forest in South America. So this is just to give you like the dimension on how much carbon footprint it takes to train one of those uh, gigantic networks these days. And I keep joking saying, and you're feeling guilty about when you booked your vacation last time, because uh, uh, this is like, and you're still doing like a machine learning model training for your models, huge models. So we actually want to talk about model optimization and model reduction. And finally, we want to do synthesis. And where synthesis, I mean efficient code generation or efficient hardware generation. So if you look, the flow that we're basically seeing is a flow that has KRS in mind, K resistance of flow 2.0. Uh, we usually tell people do not use ReLU because ReLU is unlimited. Remember what I talk about clipping? Since you're dealing with a quantized arithmetic, the, the arithmetic model has limits. So use ReLU 6, which is also what MobileNet uh, uh, recommends. Uh, if you use separable convolution, then you need probably to use uh, uh, intermediate activation to clip the outputs. So that means that you should not use the separable convolution 2D from Keras. You should use the one from a Bionet. And during training, you should apply constraints, such as clipping weights during training. For the quantization, uh, we released a library called QKeras that has been used uh, uh, in several places. And QKeras has several types of quantizers. One of them is exponent quantization that provides an interesting trade-off between uh, precision and dynamic range. What I usually say is that Matisse quantization or like int arithmetic has like a, a precision. You can control the precision, but it does not have dynamic range. Exponent quantization has dynamic range, but it does not have precision. And and you can basically think about the overall uh, uh, trade-offs when you're doing especially hardware synthesis. So what is QKeras? QKeras is a comprehensive quantization package for Keras. It's available in, in GitHub. Uh, we are probably going to have a major release in probably the next one or two weeks. So stay tuned with like some very, very interesting new features, okay? So, when people say, why do you use Keras, why not TensorFlow? Well, since version 2.0 of TensorFlow, Keras is the preferred front end for uh, TensorFlow. So Keras is part now of TensorFlow, and we basically tap on top of uh, Keras. So why do you have to think about quantization from the beginning? Even if you look at this very, very tiny ML model here, and if you're basically thinking about just floating point operations, this tiny, tiny model that probably doesn't solve much, uh, actually we have 96 floating point operations uh, uh, per unit of time. So if you need this guy here to perform like one inference in a very, very small time, then it's still like 100 floating point operations that you need to execute. Uh, some of them you can execute in parallel, but some of them you have to execute sequentially. QKeras uh, provides probably a, a, a very large number of uh, quantizers that has a, a, a non-stochastic or stochastic behavior. You have a quantization of uh, Mantissa. We have PO2 refers to exponent quantization of the number system. And that's it. But it, it's usually 
every time that someone comes to us saying, can you do the, what this paper has done? And except for uh, non-conventional loss functions, uh, we have been able to accommodate what those papers do using some of those or a combination of those uh, 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 quantizers. Uh, because uh, Keras itself, it's not quantizer friendly, we actually implemented uh, some, uh, some layers that has quantizer, quantizers in mind, which is basically tagging the, the weights and, and activations and bias for the quantizations. Okay, we are going to be releasing soon uh, um, uh, recurrent models. So this is the example that I presented to you before. So quantizing a network actually mean, in QCARES means tagging activations, tagging uh, weights and bias. So this is the result. If you do like the model summary, this is what the model comes in, in Keras. And basically in QCARES, you replace the models by the, the corresponding one. And usually, do you, why don't we have, for example, a model for flatten? Well, flatten just do data rearrangement. It does not do any uh, data arithmetic. So usually the rule of thumb is that if you're not changing the input data type, or if we can easily infer the input, the output data type from the inputs, then we don't have a layer implemented in QCARES. Okay. And for QConf, it's basically like a convolution 2D with tags for the, the weights and for the bias. And in this case here, I'm just saying it's a Mantis sequentization with four bits, zero bits to the left of the decimal point. And it's like a symmetrical representation. Sometimes symmetrical representations are uh, good for quantization. So what symmetrical representation means is that if you have positive and negative numbers, usually you have one more representation for the negative numbers, okay? And in symmetrical representation, it means that we, we clip the weights in such a way that we do not allow that representation to appear. And of course, before we used to have ReLU here, and now I'm using like a quantized ReLU with four bits, with zero bits to the left of the decimal point. And if you want to do, for example, ReLU four, you would basically say it's a quantized ReLU with four comma two. This is the number of uh, uh, integer bits. And if you do the summary now, you can have the same data that you had before, but you actually have a summary of the operations that you're doing. Uh, and it's very interesting if you look at this chart here, because you're going to see that the first convolution, assuming that the input image is eight bits, uh, we have to perform a sign multiplication between a four bit number and an eight bit number. But for the other convolutions, we can perform just four by four bit uh, operations. Okay. QCARES provides several utility functions. For example, automatic conversion from non-quantized network to quantized network, quantization of weights for deployment, estimation of accumulator sizes and gates, estimation of operation strength, as I showed you before for matrix multiplication, and even uh, binary to thermometer input conversion. And the idea here is that you reduce the first layer uh, multiplier size. So a binary to thermometer converter usually converts from like a, a, a binary encoding here to one hot encoding. And you can do like full conversion of one hot encoding, or you can do a partial conversion of uh, uh, encoders, encoders. So one thing that you have in mind when you start running those models is that CPU, NumPy, and Keras and ultra low quantization they have different uh, implementations of rounding some so sometimes you have a model that is working on numpy or keras when you go to cpu implementation then you have like differences of the model i uh, remember that rounding cpu usually refers to round to infinity uh numpy keras tensorflow they do rounding to even numbers and when you go to ultra low bit quantization uh, there is a paper by Suyog in 2015 from IBM, Suyog Gupta, that uh, uh, discusses that if you do stochastic rounding, you can improve accuracy of uh, uh, deep learning models. So 
basically with a stochastic rounding you, you can assign a pro the, the number the, the to the right of the decimal point represents the probability that you're going to be rounding a number and not the, the number itself and we actually support stochastic rounding especially because we're targeting ultra low bit quantization so if you're talking about how, how much uh, computation or how much storage do I need, uh, we have to make several decisions here. What is the input type? What is the weight type? What is the bias type? Uh, what is the output type? And with the input type and weight type, I can determine the, the multiply strength that depends on the, those types and also on the type of quantizers that I'm using. And the accumulator type depends on how many bits I need to store this multiplier. And it also, it also depends on the number of operations I'm going to execute. As I mentioned to you before, uh, Tukeros provides a very large uh, uh, number of uh, quantizers. It provides binary quantization, which is basically like plus one and minus one. Uh, binary without uh, uh, negative numbers. Ternary number system. Uh, fixed point arithmetic with or without a, a scaling factor, which is like what people call the shared exponent. Uh, a power of two, which is exponent, and power of two is very interesting. It just assume that we're basically a rounding m here to zero, a rounding or truncating m here, and now your number is basically a sign and an exponent. Okay, and it has very very interesting properties such as multiplication becomes an addition. And of course, if you don't specify any quantizers, you, you can still have hybrid networks where some networks are uh, uh, use fix some form of quantization and some portions of the network do not have any quantizers at all. Uh, for example, uh, there was a paper from 2018 on someone that was doing mixed binary and floating point uh, uh, ResNet networks. So if you basically talk, talk about a, a binary network, a, a binary weights, for example, or binary uh, activations, uh, usually this multiplication here, you can eliminate this multiplication altogether because this is basically a sign operation only, multiplication by one. And if both X's and W's are binary, then this becomes an XOR, XOR or XNOR operation. Uh, usually those networks do not perform well because you need to put uh, a scaling factor at the output. And the scaling factor, if you use the four weights, they represent how much information you lose when you go from a non-quantized to a quantized uh, network. So you can think of this of like correlation between the, the quantized and, and non-quantized networks, or you can think of this as uh, energy that you want to ma minimize the energy dis discrepancy between those two models. So the same way that you have binary networks, we have uh, uh, stochastic binary networks. And the idea here is that you treat the, the sigmoid of X as a probability that you have the number being plus one and with probability one minus p that the number is going to be min one min uh, minus one. And it's very interesting because the stochastic binary carries the same properties as um, stochastic rounding of the number system, except that it adds also regularization to your network. If you're familiar with uh, uh, neural net, deep neural networks, you know that sometimes people use L1 and L2 regularizers and this adds another form of regularization if, you, if it's used for weights, okay? It's a variance uh, regularization. Uh, remember that in activation layers, you do not want to use like a stochastic representation because uh, uh, especially if you're going to implement this in hardware, random number generation can be very, very uh, area consuming or hard. Uh, ternary is very interesting because ternary adds the possibility that you create a positive effect, a negative effect on the input, or zero, which means I don't care about that input. Okay, with binary, we can only have positive and negative. Uh, on the other hand, ternary representation uh, adds an 
uh, an additional bit. So if you're talking about efficiency, about the memory transfers, uh, if you can guarantee that the majority of the weights are zero, then you can off offset the, the disadvantage of using ternary systems, which is like twice as many bits transfer. So, of course, the, the Mantissa quantization is what people usually talk about when they do 8 bits or, or any type of bit system. Uh, 4 bits quantization, 3 bits, as I showed you in the table from ICLR. And it's very interesting because if you look at data types provided by high level synthesis, they have a nat very natural way to do quantization from the, the, the quantized number into like a, a fixed point number system. So <clears throat> I'm especially fond, fond of uh, uh, exponent quantization, okay? And the reason for that uh, exp exponent quantization, you basically trade off the network by reducing the, the, the multiplication operations to additions, okay? So you can make like a, a, as much as possible a neural network to be uh, adder-based without any multiplication operations. And you know that if you're going to implement that in an ASIC or, or an uh, FPGA, that can lead to substantial gains. Usually I say that the initial layer of the network has a problem because usually the input, you have no control on the quantization of the input. So unless you quantize the inputs and sometimes you cannot do that, you end up having this uh, uh, initial operation that has at least this number here that you have no control. So if you, should, if you use exponent quantization or binary or ternary quantization, the first layer, you avoid having to do like a full-blown 8-bit multiplier by some number. And there are several other, or, or other advantages of those networks. Of course, one of the disadvantages is have to find the leading one in the accumulator when you implement that. There is a very interesting property. If you look at uh, how people make again attacks and they publish papers on that, they usually get the initial image. They add very, very small noise to the image, and then they make that image performs as something else. And this is very, very interesting if you analyze this, because they're adding a very small number to the image and make the network perform in a different way. Uh, so if you use exponent quantization, because you're trading off precision by dynamic range. This noise here will be filtered out by the number representation system. And as such, this type of attack, they will be much harder to be obtained. Okay, so usually I say that exponent arithmetic in the first layer, they make uh, uh, the network more immune, not tolerant, but more immune to uh, especially gain attacks. The ones that are, for example, are presented in this uh, paper from MIT technology review that adds like small noise around the image. So if you look at uh, uh, how people would choose data types in 2017, uh, this is like from one of the papers on uh, XNORNet. You could do by uh, floating point convolution, binary weights, binary weights and binary inputs. This is how you do. And what you care is, Today, what you do, you can actually choose uh, the input type, the out, the, the weight type, and if you basically plug in in this table here, you can choose whether you're going to need a multiplier, an adder, or just XNOR or end operations for the multiplier, and you can basically discuss how you're going to be performing the addition here, operation here. For example, if both weights are minus one and plus one, well, we just need to do pop count. Okay, you don't need to do like a full adder uh, arithmetic here. And this is like exactly the example that I showed you before. This is uh, reflected on this table that we present when you ask for the model summary in QCARES. So in this last part of the, the 
talk, I'm going to be talking about the cost of operation. How much does it cost in terms of area, in terms of energy, and I will show you explicitly the energy portion here. Uh, I'm going to refer to this paper from Mark Horowitz. That was the first paper that addressed uh, uh, where is the power going for especially ML models, okay? And this is like data transmission, which is like exceeds anything. And the other uh, uh, types that you have here goes from 8-bit uh, adds, 16-bit uh, adds, and then multiplications all the way all the way to DRAM. So you can see that the first villain here is DRAM access. The second one is SRAM access, and then you go for floating point arithmetic, and then you go for fixed point arithmetic. So anything that you can do to reduce the memory traffic, it's already like a big win in terms of energy. And on top of that, if I'm talking about selecting the best architecture, uh, if you look at this tiny example that I showed you before, you can basically say how many uh, operation reads and multipliers you're going to perform. And basically by increasing the parallelism here, I can basically uh, uh, increase the, the delay of, decrease the delay of the system. This Pareto curve here is used by synthesis tools when they decide how many uh, uh, operations they're going to do when they generate the code. And of course, we want to be able to do the same thing here. But with the addition that we have to select also uh, what is the sizes of operations. And you have to remember that uh, multiplication is usually quadratic in the number of bits and adders are linear in the number of bits. Okay? So, when you put everything together, now we want to have a Pareto curve, as we mentioned before. But in fact, when you can start trading off uh, uh, the network, uh, uh, the quantization of the network, we can, instead of having just one single point that you can choose from, you can basically make trades offs and choose much, much better uh, points in terms of area or delay. And to show you this, I'm going to show you how we can analyze the, the different implementations using a high level model. And I have to, to basically uh, tell you that in this model that I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to basically be using a, a model that uh, basically makes the following assumptions. I have a DRAM. The data has to be brought from the DRAM to an SRAM before it can be accessed. Then it's accessed here several times in the access in, in the SRAM. And then we have the multiplication and the addition here. And in this high level model, I'm not considering uh, unrolling effects. So uh, if, you, if you consider data unrolling and distributed as RAM, you start having other types of uh, uh, problems in this high level model, such as you need to know uh, uh, data correlation for power of those green registers here, which I'm not going to consider in this data in, in this model. So. This is equivalent in cache, if you are familiar with cache design and the three C's of cache design, this is equivalent to say that I'm only considering compulsory accesses to the DRAM. Compulsory accesses, if you remember, is the first access that you bring the data to the SRAM, and after that, the data is used from the SRAM to perform the operation. Let's assume you have this network that I want to evaluate the power. Uh, I am assuming that the inputs and outputs are here. The intermediate tensors can be stored in the DRAM and, and SRAM. And I'm also assuming that the weights are fully fused to the implementation. Okay, by fused to the implementation is that they do not need to be read from the SRAM and DRAM. And the network in question is uh, this network here that has uh, uh, one bit weights for the first layer, four bit weights and activations for the second layer, and four bit weights and activations for the last layer. So this is very interesting because you can see here that the number of operations that we have in the first layer far exceeds by one order of magnitude the, the other operations. But because we're using one bit weights in the first layer here, they, we do not need to implement multipliers here. We, we just have to consider a multi multiplexers to perform those operations. And after that, then it's four bit and four bit here. 
So the first thing that we did, we actually got this uh, uh, power model from uh, Mark Horowitz that is also presented on this YouTube uh, presentation here. And we extracted some polynomials based on this data. And we had to be uh, uh, cautious about these polynomials because sometimes you have two points here. For example, we have 8-bit header, 16-bit header. And I added a third point saying that uh, in zero bits, we don't have any headers for stability of the polynomial, okay? So we don't have any bits for the header, the, the energy dissipation. So with this, I, I can extract some polynomials. Uh, here that tells you how many picojoules per bit if X here is the number of bits, okay? And I extract those polynomials from uh, Mark Horowitz. And applying this model with the original model basically running on uh, floating point 16, you can see that to perform one inference in this model, we are talking about uh, 258,000 picojoules for memory accesses in, the, in my model. Uh, multiply and add is like 402, uh, pico, 1,000 picojoules. And the total uh, power estimation here is like 660. And with this, if I use my model that the initial multiply and add can be performed with multiplexers, we're talking about like a, a, a big reduction in terms of the, the energy consumption of those models. Uh, just a word of caution here. Uh, just remember that since I'm talking about a very high level model that does not have any architecture effects, this model, this high level model is not good for telling what is the actual power of the model, but it's good to tell you how those two models compare, okay? So you should take those two numbers here with a grain of salt because they basically are good for comparing numbers if one is less than the other one, but they're not good to tell you what is the actual number. And the simple reason for that is that uh, this number here to get the actual uh, power number, you'd need to multiply by a factor that is like the architecture and you need to add here like an offset so the, the always on part of the power model. And because of this additive and multiplicative effects of the actual architecture, uh, that can lead to, to big variations, but, to, but this, they're still valid if you're comparing if this is greater than this, okay? Because the additive and multiplicative effects, they disappear if you're just doing a comparison of a greater than or less than. So as conclusions, uh, I showed you that uh, how we can do like application specific ML cores to gain significant power and area benefit over uh, general purpose machine learning. I showed you QCARES that is available on GitHub for a quantization library. I showed you how quantization adds a new access to ML hardware flow. If you can basically treat that as a, a, a you, you have different points on the Pareto curve. And I discussed with you the need for high level models that you can quickly evaluate different alternatives and show you how such model can be used to estimate the energy and consumption on the models. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Claudio Nor. So now we are open for questions. So if somebody has a question uh, in the YouTube channel, please just. Uh, write your question then you can read it to claudio nor so no question for the moment so i have one claudio nor uh, in the design of the the course uh, for this are you considering the use of hardware accelerators for each function so that's a very good question. Uh, actually, uh, one part of the, the thing that I'm looking at is how to generate uh, uh, hardware acceleration that are targeted for a specific implementation. Uh, there is a paper by Jeff Dean published a few uh, years ago, I think it's 2017 or 18, where he said that there are several heuristics that you have implemented in several places in software or hardware or something like that. And those heuristics can be replaced by ML models. 
So if you if in, in if you consider that you can build like a very tiny ML models that replaces heuristics inside uh, SOC, and in fact uh, we have been working with CERN. CERN has a system for hardware synthesis called EdgeLS for ML, and that and that model uh, basically uh, connects nicely with uh, QKRS. Okay, and that okay, generates that uh, generates yeah. decelerators. Good. So we have here a, talk, a, a question by Oscar Matia. So the question is, thanks for the great talk, Claudio Nour. Can you please comment on the role of emerging memory for edge devices? Uh, that's a very good uh, uh, topic. I had looked into the, the emer emerging memory types, uh, like memory resist or, or, or uh, those types of memories. Uh, it, it, it's interesting that they provide a way for you to do the, the multiplication. If you look at an ML model, where you usually gain, let me just go back here a few slides. So if you look at this implementation here, one of the biggest gains for uh, uh, ML models integrated with uh, uh, accelerator is that you do not have to bring the data all the way here. And this could, if you have low bit width, this could be in the memory cell itself. Okay, that's what people say. Uh, analog models has the benefits of adding, you do not have to add the, this accumulator here. And usually they can be performed by uh, uh, analog sum. Okay, uh, there's the issue of noise margin. And another issue that I have seen in the past is that, um, Sometimes the weights uh, or the activations, if you use a ReLU activation, for example, the ReLU activation always has a bias. So it, it means that the model will, will be always on, okay? So we discussed before that there is a, a, with some uh, uh, people that, that uh, uh, there is some work to be done in how to reduce the, the energy for those models especially for those models that require a lot of uh, uh, computation and that relies on ReLU, for example. But uh, yes, uh, uh, I'm not looking into that right now. I'm looking at the digital implementations, but it's something that I, I, I've seen. Okay. Okay, so we have another question by Vanderson Rosario. So you said that the graph model optimizations appears when quantization is applied. Would you talk about them? Graph model optimization. Graph I don't remember. model optimizations. I don't remember talking about graph <laughs> model optimizations. <laughs> so what I oh what I said is model optimization in general. Okay. So if you look here, okay. So uh, what people are realizing is that uh, uh, you can do model optimization, you can do uh, quantized, uh, uh, quantization. And those two operations are usually uh, important to achieve a, a better uh, uh, reduction of the model. Okay, there has been some papers on that. And I think if I'm not mistaken, Uh, this paper from MIT actually addresses, if it's not this one, there's another paper from MIT that addresses the, the, the model optimization portion, okay? So, but the, the, there is a trade-off that you can do with model optimization together with, uh, uh, with quantization. For example, uh, uh, in this guy here, in this work from Berkeley, what they attempt to do, they attempt to, to actually to run the Hessian, to co compute the Hessian, and the, the not the Hessian itself because it becomes quite hard, but the, the leading eigenvalue of the Hessian. <clears throat> and they use that to guide the model optimization, the quantization. And this here is more like a reinforcement learning type of approach in, in where they, do, they attempt to do uh, they attempt to do a little bit of optimization together with quantization. And there have been, I, I've been aware of like maybe a few more papers more recently where they try to do that. Okay. 
usually can do like a, a, some optimization if you try to do that. Okay, another question by Guilherme Goro. Uh, is HLS for uh, ML uh, with QCARES capable of implementing bigger models like uh, VGG or ResNet? So I don't know if I have, they have used uh, uh, VGG or ResNet, okay? For sure they have synthesized like a, a tiny ML models. Uh, with it, so I I don't know if it, they have done that, and in fact, uh, yeah, that it's an active area of research how to do those models with like very very efficient uh, computation schemas because uh, uh, you need more. So if you need to implement something very efficient, that goes against. Uh, using more generic accelerators that you can reuse. On the other hand, uh, you, you, you start uh, uh, having to, to require the models to be larger and larger, right? So, yeah, so it's an active uh, uh, use. And, and maybe for those types of models, if you're talking about VGG, VGG can be huge. You, you probably need to do a hybrid of those models where a portion it is of, of it is like a, a, an accelerator. There is a... a, a, a it's an accelerator that is, uh, how do I say? So more generic and the other portion is basically, uh, is implemented in, in a customized accelerator. And this is actually quite interesting because if you look, if you do the power budget of those models, you can see that if you concentrate on maybe two or three blocks of those models, uh, that consumes the majority of the power. Or, or the delay or the throughput or memory access or any other metric that you want to use. So uh, there is a, a video talk by MIT where uh, I think it's Vivian Z. Uh, okay. Uh, where she, she or someone else from MIT uh, basically says that if you basically concentrate on those models that uh, those blocks that that required most of the operations, you can do a hybrid, even if you cannot do a full VGG implementation, you still can have substantial gains from concentrating on the, the models that, or the blocks that actually matter, okay? Okay, uh, another question by Junior Petri. Uh, Mr. Caldionor, could you talk a bit about uh, pruning models on neural networks? So, uh, Pruning models on neural networks, there are uh, several flavors of it. And there are like a, a mod, if you, there's a paper called the lottery ticket hypothesis and what we can do about it. I think it is, that's the title of the paper. It, it's quite interesting. And they basically talk about how to prune uh, nodes and prune uh, edges on the network. Uh, pruning edges of the network it has uh, the advantage that usually can get better results, but the, the, it creates more sparse matrices, okay? And because it creates more sparse matrices, uh, it actually has some drawbacks because a uh, sparse matrix uh, uh, model implementation is usually much, much worse in terms of performance. By the way, if you're going to be uh, uh, creating like uh, uh, models that are specific for one specific application, you can deal with the sparsity very nicely. So those models usually they, they operate on sparse uh, matrices very well, as opposed to general purpose accelerators. Another question by Victor Costa. So could you please explain how some quant quantization schemes leads to model regularization? Oh, that's so the idea here is the equation. Uh, uh, there is a, a video lecture from Hinton when he was still at Toronto. Okay, I don't know if it's like video lecture 12, 9 or 7. It's one of the three. Okay. And Basically, he discussed the, the arithmetic of that, but basically, if you have uh, activation 
with a stochastic weight, this is equivalent to adding uh, L1 or L2 to the, the weights, okay? But if you have a regularization, uh, if you add stochastic behavior to the, the weights instead of activations, this adds variance, uh, uh, this adds variance to regularization, okay? So usually you put that on the weights instead of the, the instead of the, the, the activations. So you don't get L1 or L2 on, on the weights, but it adds some regularization and it makes the network a little bit more immune to noise. That's the other way to think about it. But I would refer you to the Hinton lecture from the University of Toronto. It's like either lecture seven, nine or 12. It's one of the three where he talks about uh, regularization on his neural network course. He spends well, almost the entire, he spends almost the entire, uh, a big chunk of the lecture basically discussing that. Okay, another question by Mateus Trevisan Moreira that is now in California also. So uh, thanks for the question. And uh, he is uh, giving thanks for the great talk. So there is a, a large set here of uh, people giving the congratulations for the nice talk. But the talk of Mateus is, can you talk a bit on how to guarantee precision after quantum and what is the trouble in uh, terms of precision loss in uh, ML applications like a computer vision or NLP? Yeah, that, that's a very interesting talk. People usually, whenever I talk to people who wants to do a machine learning model, they usually tell me that they want to do uh, a machine learning model with one bit, everything, and they don't want to lose anything in terms of accuracy of the model, right? So this is like, uh, suppose that I have, uh, I want to drive a Ferrari here in California, but I have a, a budget to drive a Ford car. Okay, those two things are completely uh, uh, contradictory, okay? So the other option that you have is that you can do, heterogeneous quantization comes exactly at the trade-off. Given that I cannot have the completely binary network because it's going to be extremely efficient but very low accuracy, and I have the floating point number system that I cannot work on, what is the trade-off? There is like a, a, a very, very linear trade-off of the layers. And as I said before, if you concentrate on the layers that really matter first, you can spend more time trying to, to quantize those. And, and then uh, uh, you may end up with a point that maybe I'm not going to be losing 10% or 20% of accuracy, but maybe like two or 3% of accuracy, but I can then gain in power, maybe like a, a 10X in power. So instead of having my battery life lasting for one hour, it's going to uh, uh, last now for 10 hours when executing my model. Okay, so we have a question by Professor Altamir Suzin. So thanks for the presentation. Uh, people frequently say that there will be knowledge transfer. Would you say something about uh, that, especially considering so many different machine learning architectures? Yeah, I, I'm assuming when you talk about uh, knowledge transfer, I'm talking. You're talking about uh, transfer weights, okay? So. If you're basically going to be transferring weights from a non-quantized uh, layer network to a quantized layer network, I have mixed feelings about that. And the reason for that is that uh, even if you assume that the problem is your original neural net is like completely a convex optimization, if you go to a binary implementation, that's not convex optimization anymore, okay? It's like if you have a simplex model and you try to do integer linear programming with the model, and sometimes the optimal solution for one is not the optimal solution for the other ones because it's not convex optimization. So quantization makes the convex optimization uh, uh, approaches that you apply to, to neural networks much, much worse, okay? And the, in, for that uh, uh, reason, uh, sometimes I see that doing transfer learning helps in the initial uh, uh, setup, 
sometimes it does not help at, uh, at all and I have just to drop the, the, the weights and start from like random weights to train the network. So it's like a 50 50 percent guess. If we're talking about transfer weights from uh, if we're talking about transferring weights from um, when you train the model in floating point 32, transfer learning of the weight, uh, usually people do that quite often when they have like they have already trained the image net and they will basically train a network for a new solution. They usually freeze the initial layers and they train just the last layers of the network. That's actually quite common. And that's why I said that whenever people say that they need like a completely programmable neural network, neural network because they're using transfer weights to, to train the, the model, they're actually not starting with the weights being completely random. They actually freeze the, the initial weights of the model. Okay, and that's the weights that you can probably uh, uh, have an implementation with no weights being programmable at all. Okay, so thank you very much, Claudio Nor, for this very nice talk in a very state-of-the-art subject. So thank you very much to, to all you again to attend uh, this talk. Thanks again to Claudio Nor Coelho that is now in uh, California, also taking care. And uh, thank you very much for everybody. See you soon, or okay. at least uh, next Friday. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye.